science fans and welcome to Sciencia. Our topic for today are principles of genetic transmission. In 1976, a blockbuster of science communication publication was born when Richard Dawkins posited a gene-centered view of evolution. Richard Dawkins' idea was that genes strive for immortality and individuals and species are merely vehicles in that quest. The behavior of all living things is in the service of their genes. Hence, metaphorically, genes are selfish. Before this, it had been proposed that natural selection was transforming the physical features and behavior of living things to promote the survival of the fittest individual or species. But Dawkins proposed that it was the gene itself that was trying to survive. It was only that its best interest was in surviving with other genes together in the impermanent husk of an individual. And this has aligned our study of the DNA with the study of evolution itself. But to understand the gene's dreams for immortality, we must first understand how it is transferred from one cell to the next and from an older generation to the younger generation. But to do this, let us first establish some rules or regularities in the genetic content of living things across different species. First, the nucleus of all somatic cells in an organism contains a fixed number of chromosomes. The numbers vary among species but bear little relation to the complexity of the organism. Consider that a moth has more chromosomes than us and that a scorpion has less chromosomes than a fruit fly. And just to clarify some terms, somatic cells are mature functional cells. They are incapable of cell division and eventually die of old age. Germ cells, on the other hand, are the reproductive cells of the body. They refer to the sperm cells and egg cells. There are also special mitotic cells. These cells are more popularly known as stem cells and are responsible for cell division to allow the body to grow, develop, and repair damage. Moving forward, the second regularity is that chromosomes in the nuclei of somatic cells are usually present in pairs. Let me clarify that chromosome pairs do not contain the exact same information. After all, half of it comes from the mother and the other half comes from the father. Think of it as each chromosome will contain the recipe for the same protein, but the instructions contained within the recipe may be different. For example, in chromosome 15, you have the gene for the color of your eyes, but one of your chromosomes might say it's color blue, while the other one will say it's color brown. And for the third and final regularity, the germ cells or gametes have nuclei that contain only one set of chromosomes, consisting of one member of each of the pairs. These chromosomes are the vehicles used by genes to transfer from one cell to the next and from one generation to the younger generation in order to achieve immortality. But the transfer process of the chromosomes itself is governed by a specific set of genes that produce a specific set of proteins that create the process known as the cell cycle. The cell cycle begins with G1 phase where doubling of all cellular contents except for the DNA occurs. In the background controlling all of these events are a unique set of molecules called cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases. Kinases are molecules that add phosphate groups to other substances in order to activate them. Cyclin-dependent kinases, as their name suggests, are inactive without cyclins. But once these two bind together, they can now add phosphate groups to proteins or phosphorylate them in order to activate these substances. During G1, the binding of cyclin D leads to the activation of cyclin-dependent kinases 4 and 6. In this active complex, they can phosphorylate the retinomoblastoma protein, which would then free E2F for expression. This opens the possibility of transitioning to S phase. But before that, the cell must first encounter the restriction point. 
the restriction point checks for the presence of growth factors that signal the need for new cells to be made. Without growth factors, the mitotic cell will not undergo cell division and remain at rest. If the growth factors are present, the cell then checks for sufficient amount of nutrients to allow for cell growth. Eventually, it will check if the cell has grown enough in such that it is roughly the size of two cells. And finally, it checks for DNA damage. DNA damage is critical. If the nutrients are low and the cell has not grown to the right size, it will just wait until those criteria are met. But if DNA damage is present, apoptosis or programmed cell death occurs. But let's say DNA damage is not present. The cell then transitions to S phase. Here, DNA undergoes replication. Yup, the natural process of the DNA cloning itself. This is a time when it happens. And while this happens, no protein synthesis occurs because the cell needs to focus all of its energies in copying the DNA. And please remember, cyclin A and cyclin-dependent kinase 2 is needed in order for DNA replication to occur. Once replication is completed, the cell then transitions to G2 phase. G2 phase is characterized by massive protein synthesis to recuperate from S phase and also to prepare all the needed materials for mitosis. At the end of G2 is the G2M checkpoint, where cell size is checked once more. The completeness of DNA duplication is also verified, and then finally, to the critical scan of DNA damage. And just like in the G1S checkpoint, DNA damage here will result to cell death. But if DNA damage is not present, then G2 will transition to the mitotic phase. Mitosis is also controlled by its own set of cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases. Cyclin ACDK1 and cyclin BCDK1 complexes promote the events of mitosis. For those of you who have studied mitosis before, a point of clarification. Interface is technically not part of mitosis itself. Interface is a term used to refer to G1, S, and G2 phases combined and are preparatory phases needed in order for the mitotic phase to occur. The first part of mitosis is prophase. It is characterized by the disappearance of the nuclear membrane, the condensation of DNA into chromosomes, and the separation of the centrosomes to begin the formation of spindle fibers. After this, a transitionary period occurs called prometaphase, where spindle fibers begin to attach to chromosomes in the structure called centromere. The centromere is considered the center of a chromosome, the portion that joins sister chromatids together. In mitosis, sister chromatids are the two DNA copies or clones formed during replication. The centromere is covered by a protein called the kinetochore, and this is where the spindle fibers attach. The attachment of the microtubules in the spindle fibers move the chromosomes into the metaphase plate or the equatorial plane of the cell, which happens to be the exact center of the cell. After metaphase, the cell encounters another checkpoint, which is very creatively called the metaphase-anaphase checkpoint. This checkpoint ensures that a set of events have occurred in order to allow the sister chromatids to separate. During metaphase, a molecule called cohesin keeps the two sister chromatids together. Only the enzyme separase can destroy cohesin. But separase is inhibited by securin. During the mitotic phase, the anaphase-promoting complex is activated and binds with CDC20. And this allows them to inhibit securin, thus releasing separase to destroy cohesin. Another important aspect in this checkpoint is that the microtubules attached to the chromosomes should be pulling from opposite ends. They cannot be attached on the same side because then the sister chromatids will not be pulled apart. 
Anaphase will then proceed with the sister chromatids traveling to opposite poles of the cell. This happens due to the shortening of the microtubule as it becomes disassembled by the centrioles. The poles of the cell also move apart to further elongate the cell and help in the separation of the chromosomes. As anaphase ends, a contractile ring forms around an animal cell and a cell plate forms across a plant cell. This prepares the cell for separation and is also marking the beginning of telophase. Telophase begins with reformation of the nucleus. Once this protective barrier has formed, the chromosomes relax back into a looser conformation called chromatin. The contractile ring formed during late anaphase contracts further, resulting to cytokinesis, or the separation of the cytoplasm and a new cell membrane forms. The successful production of two daughter cells that are genetically alike is a successful conclusion of one round of the cell cycle. This also means that our selfish genes are one more step closer to achieving immortality. So what makes the genes selfish? So you will notice in the cell cycle, whenever the DNA is changed or damaged, it automatically causes the cell to undergo programmed cell death or apoptosis. This is because the gene only cares about its original form being transmitted to the next generation. If it is changed, it doesn't care if its vessel or the cell or the organism itself dies as long as there is a means for the original version to transmit itself. Of course, removal of these modified genes is beneficial to us because it might lead to disease. But this mutualism is simply a byproduct of evolution that will allow the gene to survive. So, the first memes are actually the genes we carry. After all, a meme is a cultural element that spreads by means of imitation and often carries symbolic meaning representing a particular phenomenon or theme. I hope you were able to learn something from this short video on genetic transmission. We will continue the lesson in another video, this time focusing on how our selfish genes transfer from an older generation to a younger generation. I hope you can give this video a like and also consider subscribing to our channel. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, please don't hesitate to message me, your resident Filipina scientist, in the comments section below. Thank you very much and see you around!